Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Svarim Chatter podcast. For this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Rabbi Basil Herring, who is the former executive vice president of the RCA and the editor-in-chief of uh, the topic of this conversation, which is the new RCA Siddur, Siddur Avodat Halev, which was published by Koran. And uh, we'll be discussing the Siddur. So thank you very much, Rabbi Herring, for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. So why don't we start off, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, as you may have uh, detected from the way I talk, um, I was born in South Africa and uh, learned in Karambi Yavne for several years before coming to New York, um, learning uh, in Yeshiva Srebeni Yitzchak uh, receiving smicha there, and then thereafter a PhD in uh, Jewish philosophy. Um, thereafter, uh, taught in a number of colleges um, and um, functioned in the rabbinate in uh, three or four different uh, communities in North America, US, Canada. Um, and then uh, about uh, 15 or so years ago, going to the RCA where I functioned as the executive vice president until about uh, five or six years ago, seven years ago. And currently I'm, um, should I say, uh, Retired. Okay, very nice. So the topic of uh, the conversation, like I mentioned, was the, the new sitter, the new RCA sitter. So, um, you know, how, how did you get involved in the uh, in the sitter? And, uh, you know, how did it come about? Well, as, as many of your listeners might know, back in the 80s, um, the RCA uh, partnered with Art Scroll. Uh, in producing the so-called RCA Art Scroll um, Siddur, uh, which over those decades in the in, since then has become, of course, a very, very widely used in many different communities, and not just in the modern Orthodox community, but in uh, others as well. Um, and it was a wonderful contribution uh, to uh, synagogue life and personal um, in, in so, so many ways, and it set the standard for many, many other Sidurim. Um, back in uh, perhaps 2008, um, we had conversations um, in which we felt that there was room now for a new Siddur. Time had passed. Um, the Frum community had also moved in many ways to a different place where you, have, uh, where you had a lot more knowledgeable individuals and communities, yeshiva trained and educated, and the people who could learn on their own. And we felt that this would be um, um, an opportunity to give them a sitter which um, provided a lot of the um, source material that they otherwise couldn't find in a Hebrew English sitter. Uh, secondly, um, there was the question of women in tefillah. And uh, of course, uh, in the interim over the last 30, 40 years, uh, many, many women had gone on, not just in terms of uh, uh, the day school educations and yeshiva educations, but had gone on to seminaries in Israel and had become much more sophisticated in terms of sources and in terms of davening um, and in terms of uh, make, taking that commitment on. And so we felt that perhaps it was time that we could perhaps um, facilitate um, their being able to use the sitter in a way which was A, grammatically correct when they were davening, and B, that kept them in mind in terms of uh, many of the tefillahs that uh, they would otherwise not find elsewhere. Um, beyond that, we also felt that there was a place for a translation that uh, was uh, perhaps more accurate and at the same time more fluent um, than might otherwise have been the case. And finally, I would say there are the questions of halacha. Um, we felt that um, many halachic issues in tefillah, whether it was uh, tachnun or whether it was halal, um, were not reflected necessarily um, in the existing sidurim, um, and therefore we felt that we could um, help uh, that segment of the population to uh, have a little more um, user-friendly aspect to it in that regard as well. So 
you may have answered this just now, but I'll ask this to you just to make sure that, that this is what uh, you'll you accomplish. Then what you'll say is that wh- why was there really the need for this Siddur, though? Because they obviously have art scroll, the RC, old RCN and the art scroll Hebrew English. And then there's obviously Koran's got the Sax Siddur. And then I don't know, they have like 15 different editions, type of Siddurim. So, and there's, there's other uh, Hebrew English. I mean, wh- why, why the need and what was the market for another RCA Hebrew English Siddur? Specifically, well, again, without discussing the other siduring, you know, and their strengths or perceived weaknesses, we felt that um, there was a real need for a siddur that a reflected the American Orthodox community. Some of the siduring that are out there were, were more European or British um, in terms of their uh, halachas and practices, um, and some of them um, were simply not. Um, should I say, reflective of the so-called modern orthodox or uh, datilu mi uh, philosophy to the extent that um, those things are reflected in in tefillah and in the Siddur. So therefore, we felt that uh, this was uh, the time had come to to provide that type of a a prayer experience uh, and that type of a text. So I think that's something I should just uh, jump on something that you said. I think it's important to mention here is that the Siddur, obviously anyone can use it. I'm sure you would, uh, you'll, you'll tell me, but who, when you and, and whoever else, all the team of editors was working on it, who were, was the ideal user? That you, not ideal, but who did you have in mind that you were creating this for mainly? Right. So in part, I've already uh, answered that, but let me elaborate just a little more. Um, I think we were talking about someone who is yeshiva educated, who is somewhat sophisticated, highly intelligent, whether or not um, fully informed in terms of the sources, someone who has been davening for many, many years, decades, all their lives, whatever, but who feels that, you know, perhaps my davening has uh, become somewhat mechanical or somewhat rote or you know, I just got to get through the davening. And we felt that um, that type of a balabos, that type of a community, that type of a shul um, would benefit from this. And so, you know, when we thought of who, who is the target group over here, it was that type of an individual who was knowledgeable, intelligent, uh, smart, um, and uh, wanting to deepen their tefillah experience. So again, a lot of these uh, questions obviously will be, you know, related, but I guess to start off as a broad overview before we get in depth on the translation and the notes and all the various aspects of interesting aspects of the Siddur, overall, what would you say is unique about the Siddur and differentiates it? Obviously, could be things that we already mentioned, but just to drive the point home on this specific point, just overall, what would you say? Um, I suppose um, I am somewhat biased uh, in this regard, Um, but I would say that probably the most significant contribution that the Siddur is making uh, to the genre of Siddurim is the commentary. Um, And what is unique over here is the combination of Torah sources uh, on a high level, uh, as well as academic research. Now, when I say academic research, it should be clear that um, we didn't just take any academic research. In order to be included in the commentary or in the essays at the back, that uh, academic individual, male or female, had to be a Shomer Torah Mitzvah. They had to be part of our community, our meaning the Torah community. And therefore, their academic research um, needed to be in line with the Hashkafa of the Siddur. Um, and of course, we, if someone will, will look and see, um, those individuals are associated with not just Yeshiva University, YU in New York, but uh, Landers, um, um, Hebrew University, Barilan, Oxford in England, um, various European universities, where many might be surprised. Many users and many individuals might be surprised to know just how much academic research there has been on the Siddur in terms of the development 
of tefillah, of specific tefillot, where they came from, how they were formulated, by whom, uh, what was the context in which they came about, um, and um, how that uh, influence the actual formulation of these of these tefillot. I mean, I can give you dozens of examples um, uh, at this point. Um, uh, for instance, um, the tefillah for the Medina, not for the state of Israel, but for the government. Anten shualem lachim. Where did this come from? How was this? What, what was the origin of, of, of this tefillah? Um, it was the first time that this appears is about 10, 20 years before Gerush Sfarad. And we don't know who composed it, um, but it mentions specifically King Ferdinand of Spain. And um, in that particular formulation, it is safe to say that the Jews, they were feeling uh, very um, exposed and imperiled, and they felt that they wanted to send a certain message to the ruling powers, to the king, King uh, Ferdinand, Isabella, whatever. Uh, we pray for you. We hope that you succeed. Um, and therefore, we hope that in turn you will uh, treat us kindly. And because of the particular formulation of that, uh, of course, 10, 20 years later, Gerush Sfarad occurs, the Tefillah goes, and it is immediately adopted across the Jewish world. Ashkenaz, Sephard, uh, Venice, Amsterdam, uh, Turkey, whatever. And um, it speaks to the heart and the mind of the Jews, wherever they were in terms of their being in that situation. Now, clearly this has a source in Yirmiyahu, uh, in uh, Pirkei Avos and so on, Mishnayos and so on. But that particular formulation, now, when someone therefore says that filah, it's not just something out there but it, we understand that it's grounded in a certain historical situation. It's beautifully formulated, and therefore um, we can appreciate it in that setting and subsequently as well. Okay, so that's obviously very interesting. I'm sure you'll give many more examples as we go through the various uh, aspects. I'm trying to think where we should go here, but um, I guess... We'll start at the, the top of the city, work our way down. So we'll start with the translation and before we get to the commentary where there's more to discuss. Obviously, the translation, not obviously, I should point out, this is interesting. The, the translation is not a fully new translation. It was, you took the, uh, the Sola Pool, I think it is, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, old, old translation, and it was reworked. And I'm sure you can talk about this a lot better than I can. So uh, maybe explain, you know, what the translation that you used was and how you edited it and why you made that decision. To, uh, to do that. Right. So, first of all, the, this is not the first RCA sitter. Neither was the original, in the 80s, the first RCA sitter. Um, there was the so-called the Solar Pool RCA sitter going back into the 60s. And uh, uh, Rabbi the Solar Pool was a very prominent uh, Rav um, uh, and scholar uh, and a very accomplished and highly regarded uh, individual. And he worked with a numerous uh, rabbonim of the RCA at the time to produce that sitter. And there are still shuls today which use that sitter. It is a, not a full use sitter, it's rather for Shabbos and Yom Tov. Um, so that belonged to the RCA, essentially. That was associated with the RCA at the time. And there were several editions of that in which, uh, you know, as you go along and you see things that you want to change and improve and correct, so you do, you do that as well. So we, we adopted that particular translation. And um, I would say that the translation that's in the city right now is probably 80% the solar pool. Uh, the other is, is new, which we, we had a committee initially that worked on this, um, and then individuals uh, specifically addressing particular issues in that translation. Um, and of course, being aware also of the other more recent uh, English translations, we compared and contrasted and looked to see to the extent that we could, on the one hand, be as accurate as we could be, on the other hand, um, to be as um, colloquial, to use the term, uh, to reflect current English usage um, in a way that uh, one who dubbins and uses the English is comfortable with that particular English um, uh, usage. 
And what what does that not in the context of talking about another translation, but what does this translation offer over another translation? What is its biggest mile, so to speak, to this translation particularly? Um, perhaps rather than talking in generalities, I can talk um, in, in give you a couple of very uh, specific um, uh, things. Um, um, for instance, um, when we say in the davening "Dever Cherev Rav Viagon," we translate it. Dever as epidemic, rather than uh, contagion, um, or rather than plague, um, and so on. Or the word cherev we translate as violence, rather than sword. Now, cherev is a sword, but to the contemporary uh, user, or the contemporary davener, the notion of plague, sword, famine, uh, doesn't uh, they can't? It's more difficult to identify with with that. Um, let me give you another example. Um, when we say uh, so other translations uh, will, or the word mechayim will use the term um, resuscitate the dead or revive the dead. Now, that's not exactly correct. Because to resuscitate the dead, resuscitate does not imply someone who's dead. Resuscitate means someone whose heart may have stopped beating, but they're not dead. Or to revive, you revive someone, but you're not reviving them from death. Whereas here, this is clearly a reference, as we understand it, to the, 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 um, the doctrine, Rambam Yugimul Ikrim, of resurrection. So God, Kodesh Baruch Hu, is Mechaye Hamesim. He resurrects the dead who are actually dead, as he will do in due course. So here we have a case of um, more precise um, translation. And by the way, it's not mechaye, it's mechaye. Uh, the tzere here is a noun as opposed to a verb. So therefore, it's not, Hashem, Kodesh Baruch Hu is not the one who resurrects the dead, but rather it's to be translated as he is the resurrector of the dead. Um, I, I can give you many, many more such uh, examples. Um, um, some involving a change in girsa. For example, in the Yigdal, um, uh, we will translate in the Siddur, v'chol notzar yoreg gedulato malchuto, it's translated as every creature shall make his greatness and sovereignty known. Uh, that reflects the Rambam's fifth principle, as we know, the, of, the, of, the, of the 13, and, and which is what exactly the Yigdal is referring to. So um, as opposed to the current text, which many Sidurim use, which is really a corrupted text, according to many, uh, which say um, uh, have, a, have a different girsa, and therefore that translation does not reflect the, the Rambam's Yudgim of Ikram. Um, so the, the, the translation, therefore, strives on the one hand to be um, a, a precise, on the other hand, uh, to be a more uh, mellifluous, if, if that's the word. I'll give you just one final example. Um, in, the, in the Nishmat, um, there's a difficult phrase in the Nishmat. Al-Achat mi elef al alafim. We cannot thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu even for one of the Elef Alfei Alafim. So what is Elef Alfei Alafim? So again, without mentioning the names, but other contemporary Sidurim uh, will translate that as we can't thank God for even one of the thousand, thousand, comma, thousands of thousands uh, uh, benefits. So this is not exactly how one talks uh, in, in, in our time, um, or, or even to say for even one of the thousand thousands. So how does this city translate that? Achat mi elef alfe alafim, if you look at the numbers, it's for even one of the millions upon millions, right? Uh, a million is a thousand thousand. So achat mi elef alfe alafim, 
would be one of the millions upon millions uh, of the of the benefits that Hakadosh Baruch Hu, uh, grants to us. So you know, the, these are the kinds of things to which uh, the translation um, is, is sensitive. Obviously, that's uh, very interesting. So some uh, very interesting examples as well. So now we'll we'll move down towards the uh, towards the bottom. Um, actually, one more thing when we're in the text, we'll point out the, uh, one more thing is that uh, many people may be familiar. Some Sadurim have, uh, when you get to various Yom Taivim or different things, there's, there's various, if you forget to say something, Hamel HaKadosh, for example, or whatever. There's a halacha in, in the Siddur, so um, many Sadurim have it in the back. Turn to the back, and there's like a halacha section. And here, you don't have that, right? The, the halacha is in each location. So talk about that for a little, and why, what was the decision to do it that way? Well, I think mostly for convenience sake. If one is uh, uh, davening the Shemona Esrei and it's Aseret Yimei Tshuva and you said uh, uh, Hakel HaKadosh instead of Amelach HaKadosh, it's much better to have the halacha that you can refer to and say, oh, what do I do now? It's right there on the page. As opposed to now stopping, going to the back, finding the exact seif, similarly in the back over there, um, and so on. So therefore, just in terms of the convenience, um, to have the relative halach, the relevant halacha, right there when davening, uh, we felt that there, that there would be uh, a benefit to that uh, in that respect. Okay, so now that we made our way, our way slowly down, we get to the commentary, which, as you said, is the uh, biggest thing in the sitter. So most important, however you wanted to find it. Um, so I think we'll just start with what were the what are the main sources uh, that you use and, and some examples of um, commentaries that you used or Rabbanim quoted, etc. Right. So I think it would be fair to say that uh, the most important influence um, and source in the commentary is uh, Rav Yosha Ber Soloveitchik. Um, he was my Rebbe. I learned with him at Shiva uh, Rabbeinu Yitzchak Hanan. Um, he was the guiding light and mentor for so many of the Rabbonim of the RCA. Um, and therefore, much of uh, his thought, his chidushe Torah, his hashkafa, uh, is found in this, uh, in this Siddur. But it goes beyond him alone. I would say that the whole brisk tradition is very well represented here, whether it's... Um, the Beis HaLevi, whether it's the Nitziv, whether it's the Meshach Chochma, whether it's Baruch HaLevi Epstein, and so on, um, these um, are quoted uh, at significant length. Um, and um, when we say quote, obviously being a, a commentary on the Siddur, it's very hard to quote them verbatim. So the, the, the commentary seeks to take the kernel of their ideas and to summarize them in as few as words as possible. Uh, without quoting uh, chapter and verse, because again, this is not an academic work, so we don't say, well, if you want to know where this uh, where this chiddush came from, you have to go and look in the sefer or that or that uh, um, uh, source. So, but we do attribute it by name to the particular source. But beyond brisk and beyond the Soloveitchik name and uh, tradition, um, we did try to be as as comprehensive as possible. So we will have ideas there from the uh, Chofetz Chaim, from uh, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, um, from um, uh, the Pachad Yitzchak, uh, from many of the sources that you won't find in other Sidurim. And we also try to combine um, medieval uh, sources, whether it's the Rambam, the Rajbar, Rashi, and so on, um, or obviously early modern and uh, more modern uh, sources as well. Um, so the, 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 the learning side of things, the, the Torah side of things is quite wide. And I'm sure someone, everyone will say, well, how come you didn't quote my Rebbe? How come you didn't put in uh, this yeshiva, this uh, source, and so on? Clearly, uh, we had to count the words. The space was limited. And... Uh, uh, we had to um, make certain, you know, difficult decisions to leave this out, put this in, but we did try to be as a representative um, as possible. Interestingly, um, some some of 
some of that uh, also involves women who have made their mark in uh, Torah learning, who have dedicated many years uh, to, to learning as well. And uh, some of their comments are also incorporated. Uh, I'll give you one particular example of a very, very knowledgeable woman who, who, who is an academic who is now a emeritus professor at, Bar, at uh, the Hebrew University, uh, Shulamit Elitzur. Uh, many of your uh, listeners may not know her or may not have used her or read her, uh, but a remarkable, remarkable woman. And uh, there are very few people that I know of who come close to her when it comes to piyut uh, in tefillah and the sources of piyut and, and analyzing piyut and so forth. So uh, we have comments by her as well on, on specific things um, uh, and those in that, in that, in that camp too. Yeah, she, I'm not uh, personally, uh, I don't know so much about Piet. I have a lot of friends that are, I mean, she's like the uh, queen or both queen and king of Piet. So she like, is like the titan in the field of Piet uh, in the world t- today. So obviously that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Also, uh, Rav Kok, I saw, has represented a, a fair bit here and uh, many others. Uh, you know, the, the commentary, like you said, it has sources are from right to left and left to right, everybody in between. Um, so what is the, the style of the commentary? Obviously, that's hard in, in such a sitter, but was there a particular style that you were aiming for? And if there is, is it, can someone, is it easy, easy to understand, to see that? And what, what is that? So first of all, wherever possible, we try to bring in the Gemaras, probably Yerushalmi or the early Midrashim. Um, and to be loyal to what they were saying, just on, on the Pshat level. Um, and when quoting uh, the Rishonim, uh, we try to re- take, you know, take their sources and show how they extracted from their sources, from the earlier, the earlier literature, Mishnah, Gemara, um, Midrash, Halacha, and so forth, um, so therefore, it was grounded. We felt that the that the commentary needed to be grounded in the classic sources, uh, but at the same time, uh, to be developed um, by the subsequent uh, Mefarshim and Poskim uh, in a way which uh, showed the development here of 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 these um, of these filot and uh, how uh, they re- reached the point uh, where they where they are today. So I think that in terms of style, and I don't think you're referring now to the language so much as to the structure uh, of the of the commentary, uh, we thought that we would attempt anyway to um, show how the sources, starting out obviously with Tanakh, Chumash, and so on, were then developed over time and brought right you know, into the Siddur, into the current form that it's at. Right, and then I also mean, similar to this also, is that most of the comments that you actually wrote here in the commentary, are they pshat-based? Are they meant to inspire? Are they meant in a, like a certain, like what type were they supposed to be also? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, yes, we, we did, we tried not to um, become overly drush-oriented. Um, yes, there are times when you do want to inspire. I'll give you an example. Um, um, in the in the Birch HaShachar, Mekadesh um, Shimcha So, what 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 is this all about? Why do we say it over there? Everyone knows there were times when Jews were persecuted and they couldn't say the Shema. So they were the so the the tefillah of the saying the Shema was put at an earlier point in the davening so that uh, they could say it without being persecuted for saying the Shema. But it also was the time or the text by which people who were Mekadeh Shem Shamaim Berabim, i.e. martyrs, who gave their lives, would say this bracha. Um, and therefore, in the commentary here, um, we didn't just want to give the original context or the original structure. We also wanted to make it very current and relevant. And so we tell the story uh, from uh, Yafa Eliach's uh, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust, um, of uh, a terrible um, episode during the Shoah of uh, women, young women, 
who were um, Moser and Nefesh, uh, but who insisted that they first wanted to go to the mikveh, and that the Germans, Yimach uh, uh, allowed them to do so, and that they thereafter, once they'd gone to the mikveh, that they um, gave, gave their lives you know, under those circumstances. It's a horrific story. Um, but we wanted to show how Jews over the centuries would, um, would, would be Moser Nefesh, Guf Nefesh, in a way that uh, made this tefillah uh, all the more uh, personal and significant for, 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 for one who is davening even today. So that's a very interesting story, interesting that you included it. Are there any other particular, not necessarily stories like that inspiring, but other examples from the commentary in other particular ways that you want to tell the listeners about? Right. So there is a significant question that arises in the context of uh, Zimun, Birkat Hamazon. Um, when we say Rabosai Nevareich, who are we referring to? Who are the Rabosai? So most Sidurim, to my knowledge, that translate that term, translated as gentlemen. Let us bench, let us say grace, gentlemen. Now, what about the women sitting around the table? Are they halachically included in a zimun? So here we can go to Rav Soloveitchik. Um, uh, one of his Talmidim, uh, Rav uh, Reichman, put out a Rishimus of the Rav on Rochus, in which he points out that in one of his shiur, and the Rav said, a woman cannot constitute a zimun. She cannot be one of the three to make a zimun when there are two men for her to be the third. But once she's sitting at the table and there are three men, then she is part of the zimun. And in fact, to the extent that um, she doesn't have to bend, she just answers amen to the mezamen because she's part of the zimun. She's part of that, of that chabura. Um, so therefore, when, we, when the Mizamen in that instance is Mizamen, the people sitting around the table, and there's a woman over there, he's not just saying, gentlemen, let us say, let us uh, do Birchat HaMazon. He's including, he's including the women who are sitting there as well. And by the way, we do also quote, um, and some might find this a little controversial, but it shouldn't be, uh, Reb Shlomo Zaman Albach, who says, and others, that three women are mezame, right? Uh, but they cannot join two men to make a zimun, but three women can. And a man who is sitting there should also respond to their zimun. But the point here, and this combines the question of the translation with the commentary, and the commentary explains all of this. Why do we translate as not as gentlemen, but we use a much more gender neutral uh, expression of uh, honored uh, or esteemed colleagues? Uh, let us say grace, let us bench, because the women truly are part of it. And not, it's not just emotionally that the woman who worked so hard to put the food on the table should feel part of the zimun, but in fact, halachically, she is part of the zimun. Very nice and very interesting. So one other thing about the commentary I want to ask you also, there's a number of comments from yourself, and I think maybe one of the, some of the other editors as well. So obviously you won't talk for them, but for yourself, you know, what was the decision when you put in something from yourself? And where where did you get that from? Was that something you original uh, Torah thoughts? Or was that something that you got from somewhere else? What was what went into that? It's a good question. Um, and it was very subjective. Clearly, when there was something that I thought was a chiddish that I never found anywhere else in any of the sources, or an extension of an original of an earlier source, which that earlier source didn't draw out and apply. Um, then I put my name on it. Um, if, however, it was more of a general, a general statement, which was shared by many Mepharshim, um, then I would not put my name on it. I'll give you, can I give you one more example? Um, at the end of Birkat HaMazon, So everyone, everyone asks the question, and we're all bothered by this. What do you mean, uh, how, how can you say that? We know the whole problem of Tzadik Viralo. Huh? Tzadik Viralo. So how can David Amelech say that in, the, in, the, in this passage? Many give their own answers. 
Now, what I did over here, and again, I put my name on this, because I took something that the Rav, Rav Soloveitchik, once said in a share that he gave back in, in the 1950s. He said, part of what we learned from Yitzhak Mitzrayim is that there is righteous, there is justice, but it doesn't happen necessarily in your lifetime. It'll happen to your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren, right? And we learned this because the Jews who suffered, the Israel who suffered in Mitzrayim, they never saw justice when they died, but their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren did. So this was the Rav, and we quote the Rav, and this is what he said. However, he never applied it to this posuk, which is a problematic posuk. Lo ra'iti tzadik nezav v'zaro mevakesh lachem. Yeah, I've seen tzadikim who are nezavim, but the zaro mevakesh lachem, that, that this should persist over the generations, this I've never seen, because in the end, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does bring justice, if not to you, then to your descendants in time. So I said, I, the Rav didn't say that. He didn't apply to that pasuk that I did. So therefore, I put my name on it. That, you know, that, that type of a thing. Very, very nice. Um, the last mm -hmm. thing that I'll ask you about the commentary, I really just, we touched on academic sources, but I don't know if there's something else you wanted to mention, any particular academic sources or other examples that you had of an academic uh, comment and something that you incorporated that in that regard that was unique to the Siddur? There's so many, there's so many um, uh, brilliant academic uh, an analysts of, of, of tefillah. There are, it's, it's hard for me to choose one, um, but um, uh, there is one that comes to mind off the top of my head, and that's Beryl, uh, the, uh, Professor Septimus of Harvard. Um, who's done a tremendous amount of work on, on, on tefillah. So um, he pointed out, how do you, in, in the Shemona Esrei, how do you translate um, uh, the phrase um, um, for gerim that we use over there for a ger tzedek? What is a ger tzedek? All right? Uh, how do you translate a So, if you look in the translations of most other Sidurim, they will say the righteous converts. The righteous converts. So he points out that if you look in the Rambam consistently, they're not righteous converts. Every convert is referred to as a Ger Tzedek, as, a, as opposed to Ger Toshav. So it would be Ger Tzedek would be translated not as a righteous convert, but as a convert. And um, so this is an example, by the way, of something which may have appeared in one of the earlier gifts of the Siddur, but now that we are moving to a new edition of the Siddur, which we can also talk about, we're now preparing and working on the third edition of the Siddur, um, as it was put out originally two or three years ago, but now we are looking to come up with subsequent editions. So this will, in fact, now be featured um, in, in, that, in that edition. Right, because I just checked. It does say righteous converts now, so you're going to change that. Okay, so that's uh, for the commentary. I have these much more to discuss, but that's what we'll uh, mention, uh, talk about now. Um, and the other thing I think that we didn't get to that's uh, unique about the Siddur and very, uh, very important aspect, I think, is that the Siddur opens the regular way of a Siddur, but on the other the way uh, of the uh, book, in the English way, it does have a number of essays that you've had 100 pages or so of essays of various Rabbanim and, and others. So first of all, why, why include essays in a Siddur? What was the purpose and what are they about? Where the authors talk a little bit about the essay section. Well, as the name, Kishmo Kain Hu, as the, as the name indicates, we are looking here to create a Siddur that will enhance Avodah Salev. Avodah Salev. Kavana. Davening with Kavana. And um, most of the essays in the back, uh, well, there are two types of essays in the back. One is Halacha, Rav Shachter, who is the posseg for the Siddur, Herschel Shachter, um, uh, has a, an essay there on Kriya Satora, many of the detailed Halachas of Kriya Satora. Also, there's a wonderful essay, if I may say so, by Rav Daniel Feldman, uh, a Rebbe at uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Vachanan, on ethical aspects of tefillah in terms of how to behave and what to 
how to do and what not to do during davening uh, in the tzibur in terms of uh, halachas. And he quotes hundreds of halachas uh, in, 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 in that regard. But for the most part, those essays in the back talk about how to, the importance of kavana, how to achieve kavana, uh, not just in terms of davening, but in terms of making a bracha, um, how to prepare oneself when going to daven, uh, the importance of understanding mamash every word and trying to understand uh, what the, whether it was chazal or whether it was the rishonim, the achronim, the gaonim, uh, what it was that they had in mind and therefore what I need to have in mind. So the, the, the focus of those essays in the back was really as an aid to the user uh, to be able to find ways and to help them um, daven with, with, you know, with a heightened sense of, of being shiviti uh, Hashem uh, tamid. I'm, I'm, you know, so to sense, to be able to feel that that, that is there. Very nice. Um, okay, so I would point out, just pointing out that, first of all, the sources, uh, I, I thought this was interesting, I mean, maybe other sources don't have it uh, for the Psukim or the Chazal, where it comes from, is on, is on the, uh, I mean, the Psukim is on the side of the Siddur, it's like in the uh, margins, not like in the text or on the bottom. Um, and also, just on the other side, the Tehillim is printed, and it's it's not in like the small two columns or very small miniature font, it's in a nice big Font with a full translation as well in the back. Obviously, the Kriya Tyra for Monday, Thursday it, it, uh, is, is, it does not have translation. That is in the, the, the you know small columns. It's just filaning, so that doesn't. But the Tehillim is in is in full, which is something I wanted to um, point out. So I think the, the last thing uh, bef- to, to get to really as we uh, finish up is is you know. I, we really covered this, but just to ask it to you in a question form, just so you can focus on this specifically, is, you know, what will people gain from using this sitter? Obviously, what, 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 what did you set out that people should gain from it? What do you think, what can you tell someone listening? Someone say, okay, this is, we already discussed, you know, there's so many other sitter. So what in particular will I pick up this sitter to use? Will I gain from this sitter specifically? Well, you know, it depends on the individual. Um, is this an individual who davens uh, with Kavana, but wants to have more of a familiarity with the history, the development of Tefillah, where this, where this uh, piyut came from, uh, who composed it, uh, how has it changed, uh, how did the girsa evolve over time, and so forth. So that person will, I believe, uh, have great benefit uh, because the texts here have been very carefully reviewed and selected uh, in terms of the uh, corrected uh, texts. Uh, someone who feels that it's become simply mitzvah anashim melumada, altas tefilat keva, and so on, uh, that person uh, will will be helped. I believe, we hope, we hope, to daven with more kavana. And yet, let me inject a, a personal note. Um, you know, I was a rov uh, of kehillas uh, for many, many years, uh, shiva graduate, and. Uh, I have to admit, it over, over the course of time, uh, one becomes uh, inured to the beauty of tefillah, uh, of, of so many of the tefillahs. Um, and that, I, I must admit that uh, for, for me, in many ways, uh, you know, you had to get through the davening because uh, you had so many other things to do. And uh, you, you, you were not given the opportunity to really grow in, in, in davening in your, in your avoda. Um, we hope that this will help people like that, people like me. Uh, and I must say that having worked on the Siddur now for the last 10, 12 years, uh, it has transformed my own davening in so many ways. Um, and we, we, you know, we hope that uh, this will be the case with many others who would uh, utilize the Siddur and... Um, uh, grow and be stimulated to do their own further analysis and to find their own chidushim um, and to see how all of the gedolim throughout the generations who were so machadesh uh, in terms of Torah, in terms of uh, sugyas in, in the Gemara and, and, and so forth, they daven three times a day and look what they saw in the davening and uh, to see how they were able to uncover so many beautiful treasures that, that, that are there. And to be inspired, therefore, to find a deeper level 
uh, in their own davening um, and to uh, use this as a springboard uh, for personal growth. It's uh, not exactly the same, but uh, you, you, you reminded me of a personal story also. You said something personal, so you reminded me. I learned in uh, Philadelphia Yeshiva, and I was actually in charge of this farm there, and I got new Sidurim. <laughs> Uh, not the RCA city, but we got new Sidurim. And Rashmul Kamenetsky actually came in and he went to uh, one one day, he came to one of his tefillas and he takes a Sidur off the shelf. He has a Sidur. He doesn't usually take Sidur, certainly not a new Sidur. And I don't remember if I or someone asked him, you know, Rashiva, what are you what are you doing? So he, he said that it's sometimes you like to take a different Sidur with a different text. It breaks it up differently. It, it, it helps you to not dive in by rote. You get to think a little bit about your davening because you're not used to where everything is and it really helps you with not exactly what you were saying, but I, I, it reminded me. It's a similar kind. Con- so I guess the last question really is, are there any future projects you're working on? And mainly regarding this, either, are you already alluded to, you already made a mention of one example of your revising it and putting out a new edition. So can you talk about what re- other re- what revisions you're working on right now? Well, the, the problem is that every time I dive in, uh, and I use this seder, I see something that I want to change um, and something that can be improved upon. Nothing is so good that it cannot be improved upon as, as the uh, cliche goes. Um, right now I'm working um, or trying to uh, incorporate as much of the piyut uh, history as possible, uh, whether it's the, the keladon or whether uh, it will be uh, some of the slichas piyutim uh, which are beautiful in their own right, um, and which obviously uh, have great antiquity going back to the time of um, even before the Rishonim. Many of them go back to the 5th century, the 6th century. Some of them we know who wrote them, some of them we don't, and there's some controversy amongst the various uh, scholars on the subject. So to the extent that we can bring some, shine some light and clarity um, on those aspects of the Siddur, uh, we're going to try and incorporate that as well um, into, uh, into the text. Um, obviously we have to work with the existing text. We're not creating a new sitter and we have to keep the pagination intact because um, those who already have had the first edition or the second edition, uh, we don't want to create confusion as to the, the which page to turn to, if announcements are being made and so on and so forth. Uh, so we have to be very sensitive in terms of uh, maintaining uh, the structure such as, as, as it is while increasing and improving uh, things. Um, um, we are making changes to certain translations. Um, we are updating some of the uh, halachic um, uh, areas uh, in in the Siddur uh, that you know re- perhaps were not properly addressed um, in 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 the in the first editions. So there's much work to be done. There's much work that remains to be done, and it's a, it's an unending process. So. Um, uh, God willing, uh, we'll be able to come out with this after COVID and uh, once uh, the world comes back to some kind of uh, normality. Um, and we hope that uh, people will be able to get back into shul and daven as they did before, but except better. And uh, please, God, uh, this will be uh, part of the, um, the armor that they will have and the ammunition that they will have that will allow them to uh, uh, reach the target. Amen. So I will also obviously include the link. If anyone wants to purchase it, I'll include it in the show's notes from Koren. It should be available on farm stores also. And um, with that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Herring, for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for all of the wonderful things that you do. You're uh, very, very uh, to be commended for uh, hosting this and uh, kolakavot to you. Thank you.